You're listening to Crud Talk, a ministry of Fifty Shades of Grace. Everybody's got a story. I'm guessing like me, you've been hurt before. But what if I told you there was more to this life than being stuck in the hurt and sin of your past? Hey, we all have crud, but it's how we deal with it that makes all the difference. Today's episode is brought to you by Joe and Sharon Schroet. We thank you for your generous gift, which allows us to share hope and continue to help people deal with the crud in their lives. So thank you. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Crud Talk. I'm Sonia Bruner. How are you doing? So I recently did a conference called Identity Theft. And I'd like to do a recap if I could. So let me just jump in tonight. I'm praying that you're all doing well. So let's start. Who am I? What do I believe? What is true? What's real? What is going on with my life? And where is my peace? Have you ever felt so lost that you can't even remember who you are? What were your dreams? When were you happy? When did you feel whole? Depending on what you've been through, maybe you believed the things that people said about you and somehow that became your identity because what we believe makes all the difference. So identity, what is it? Our identity tells us who we believe we are and what we believe controls what we say and what we do. Our identity starts at birth. We all receive basic human traits, our gender, our eye color, DNA, fingerprints, that kind of thing. Did you know that no two fingerprints are the same? Not even with twins. I didn't know that. According to the American Pediatric Association, all identity forms its foundation in childhood based on our social interactions with caregivers. That makes sense, I think. I wanna touch on this for just a minute because this is a really big deal in our development because all of us were born and raised in some type of environment, right? Someone had to take care of us from birth to a certain age. And family, the the caregivers are the group we were raised in, is the number one factor in child development. So what's the big deal? If you had love, support, and attention, you learned that you were safe to ask questions or to make mistakes, to take risks, and you learned to trust others and share your feelings. People who grow up surviving learn life differently. I've talked about this a lot before. They learn not to get their hopes up. They learn to look out for themselves because that's the only person they can trust. They learn to push people away or they hold on too tight. Either way, letting others in could be the most lethal mistake and they know they might never recover should they allow themselves to hope. They learn to please others, even at the detriment of their own values and feelings with the hopes of gaining a longer lasting connection, good or bad. They learn to criticize themselves and they learn to not show weakness. They learn that words don't mean anything, actions do. So let me ask you, what kind of home did you grow up in? Was it safe, loving, kind, or was it angry or manipulative, harsh? Were you given attention or were you ignored? Did someone abandon you? Were you hurt? Did you live in fear? Were you loved no matter what? Or did you have to earn it? Depending on your environment, your identity, the foundation of your belief was formed from that. So let me introduce kind of another thought here. What if what we see, what our experience was or is now, isn't all there is? Is what we've believed so strongly true? Or is it our perception? And what's the difference? Perception is how we see things or understand things. Perception can be influenced by past experiences or expectations or the environment we live in. Perception is not reality, but perception can become a person's chosen reality. There is a difference. Perception has a powerful influence on how we look at reality. Think of it this way. Perception acts like the lens that we view reality through. What we can see is usually what we believe. According to psychologists, a more accurate phrase is, perception is my reality. But here's the danger in that. 
In today's world, perception, which depends on circumstances and can change any time for any reason, is treated as 100% truth. Some of you might have seen the cartoon of the two people there standing over the, the drawing on the floor. There's a number drawn and it's, they're arguing over whether it's a six or a number nine. So who is right? Both people see what they see as reality. But you and I can see that there might be more than one answer depending on which side you're standing on or which side you think is up or down. Our perception defines who we believe we are. The perception you have of your identity determines your success, your limitations, your interactions with people, and your relationships. So let me give you an example because at the conference, there was a lot of like deer in the headlights look, so I had to get kind of (laughs) real. So here we go. My example is this. Let's say that my belief is that I am fat and that makes me worthless. My perception is that everybody else sees me as ugly or repulsive or lazy. My perception about my weight brings me to the belief that because of how I look and how I feel about that, how I believe others feel about that, now my belief is that I am worthless and less than someone who isn't fat. So I spend my life hiding myself or talking negatively in my head or stuffing my feelings with Funyuns. (laughs) because I feel like things will never change. So I react out of that belief to others and relationships, even when they're being nice and truthful. I react with negative responses because I believe that I am unworthy to be loved. In fact, I am unlovable in my mind because of my perception and how I see myself and who I now believe myself to be. That belief is now my truth which becomes my identity. See how that works? When our belief is rooted in perception only, always changing depending on the situation or emotions we're feeling at that moment, you and I leave ourselves open to anyone and anything and we start living for other people and we let them determine who we are and how we live our lives. We spend all our energy trying to be what they say we should be or meet those expectations sometimes meeting them, sometimes failing, but always feeling empty and incomplete and dissatisfied, which causes us to seek more and more sources outside to affirm our identity. We leave ourselves open to identity theft. So listen to this, John 10, 10, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Who is the identity thief? Satan. The Bible says that Satan is the tempter, the accuser of the brethren, the father of lies, murderer, slanderer, the deceiver, the adversary. We always talk about the fact that God has a plan for our lives. If you're living and breathing, he truly has a plan and a purpose for your life. Satan has a plan for your life too. Did you know that? Satan's plan for you is to steal, kill, and destroy. It's not even really about us. Not really. I mean, don't get me wrong. He hates everything. But here's the deal. He hates God the most. He can't steal God's identity, but he can try to steal ours. How does he do it? He lies. He tries to get us to believe in anything other than Jesus. He tries to make something look like it's the truth, but it's a lie. Hmm. Doesn't that sound a lot like perception? I think it's interesting that the first thing John 10, 10 mentions is the thief comes only to steal. From the very beginning, we've had a thief who wants to steal from us. Identity theft is not a new concept. Do you know what the first account of identity theft was? So let me say this. This was really, I didn't ever think of it like this before. Satan was the first in creation to reject God's plan and purpose for what he was created to be. He rejected his God-given identity and made up his own. He wanted to be God. That's what identity thieves do. They steal someone's identity and try to make it their own new identity. He couldn't steal God's, so he went after ours. Satan starts with the seed of unbelief in Genesis 3 verse 1. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. 
he said to the woman, did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And in verse two and three, and the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it lest you die. Then in verse four, but the serpent said to the woman, you surely will not die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Y'all, this was the devil's approach to start to crumble Eve's identity. Remember, her identity is what she believes. He made her doubt and think God did not have her best interest at heart and she could have more than what God was offering. See, she knew good, but now she could know good and evil. Here's the kicker. What Satan said is partially true. You won't die. That was a lie. God knows that when you eat it, your eyes will be opened. That's the truth. And you will be like God. There's a temptation and a lie. God didn't want us to know what evil was, what sin was. He created a perfect world. When we did what he told us not to do, indeed, our eyes were opened. That's true. If They were open to sin. There's always some pieces of the truth mixed in with the lies. Remember my example about my fat perception? <laughs> there was truth in that. Um, There was truth. I am a little chubby. <laughs> Does that mean that I am unlovable or unworthy or that everyone is repulsed by me because of it? No, but because I believed it, I acted on it as if it's truth. Do you see what I'm seeing? You see what I'm saying here? How many of us have believed lies and acted on it as if it were the truth? So the whole time I'm studying this topic of identity theft, I kept asking, why is he after us all the time? What do we have that Satan wants? Our faith, our belief. He wants to take down our faith. Everything flows from our faith, what we believe y'all know Superman, right? I am a huge Superman fan. I love him, love him, love him. You know how Superman has a weakness? It's kryptonite, right? It takes away his strength and stops him from doing what he's called to do. Unbelief is our kryptonite. Satan wants our faith and belief to be anything other than Jesus Christ. If he can get us to believe in something other than Jesus, it's over. Unbelief will steal, kill, and destroy us. And that hurts God. This blew my mind when the Lord showed me this. I was like, yeah, Lord, faith is important. I get it. Certainly what we believe makes all the difference. I get that. And then Jesus was like, bam, right upside my head. Y'all, how are we saved from hell? How do we have a relationship with Jesus Christ? by believing in Jesus and placing our faith in him. Romans 10 verse nine, because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Faith is the chosen plan that brings his salvation and his sanctification and his power and healing and grace to the world. For God so loved the world. Who's the world? you and I. He gave his only son that whosoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. Listen to me. Our entire existence with Jesus Christ depends on faith. The reason that Satan wants to mess with us regarding what we believe is because nothing on earth is more powerful than the faith of a born-again disciple of Jesus. Listen to this, 1 John chapter 5, verse 4. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Through faith, nothing is impossible, Matthew 17, verse 20. What is faith? Faith is believing in things we can't see. Satan wants to steal our identity. Why? Nothing is more destructive to the purpose and the plans of Satan. Nothing is more hurtful and icky and totally stops what 
he is trying to do than a faith-filled believer and follower of Jesus. Listen to this. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For whoever comes to God must believe that God exists and that he rewards those who seek him. That's Hebrews 11 verse 6. What we believe makes all the difference. God already said at the very beginning, let's make man in our image. Let's make them in our likeness. But Satan lied. He made it sound like we were lacking, like God had withheld something from us. What a load of hooey. We had everything we needed. We were with God and made in his image. We already had our identity and it was perfect. Here's how the, at- the attack on our identity goes. And I need you to listen up because I am literally telling you the plans of your enemy. Line number one, temptation. Satan, the tempter, will downplay sin. He'll say, do it or believe it. It's not a big deal. You deserve this. This is what's best for you. This is what will make you happy. No need to resist. God will forgive you anyway. Then you sin. And as you look over your shoulder from where he was whispering all the promises of fun and acceptance and God's unending grace, and now, poof, he's gone. Faster than you can blink, you hear hissing from the opposite shoulder. The tempter becomes the accuser, spewing all these words of guilt and shame. Line number two, accusation. Satan downplays God's grace. He makes statements like this. You did that? How could you? Oh, you're so bad. You blew it. That's the worst thing you've ever done. It's too late. You've ruined everything. This is all there is now. You'll never have joy again. God will never forgive you. This is his plan. He tempts us to believe something and do something. Then he accuses us for doing it. He is relentless. He's always so in seas of temptation or accusation or both. Listen to me. And all of it is based on lies that you and I have believed. He doesn't need us to sin every day for it to have a harmful effect. The accuser loves to use our past mistakes and sin against us. Look what you've done. Oh my goodness, he'll never take you back. Whether it's 20 minutes ago or it's been 20 years, as long as you and I are focused on what we've done or haven't done, our focus is off of Jesus. And Satan loves that. It's the gerbil wheel. I talk about this all the time. The little rat, he gets on the wheel and he's feeling so bad because he had blown it again. Me, 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 me. Satan reminds us of what we've done. Remember, he's the one that said, do it. It's okay. And then accuses us for being stupid and doing it. And it's on that wheel of all the guilt and the shame that we're feeling. And we keep running and running and running. I'm so unworthy. I've blown it again. Me, 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 me. But we never get anywhere. And our focus is on us and not on Jesus. And all of a sudden, ding, 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 he's the winner. See what I mean? What we believe makes all the difference. How does our identity get stolen? Believing lies. When someone steals our identity, it doesn't become stolen until it is believed. So let me, let me explain, explain it like this. The lie is presented. In other words, the identity attack comes. So look at me. My story was full of lies about my identity. No one loves you. You're worthless. You're dirty. But here's the thing. My identity was stolen the moment I believed the lies. Sit on that for a second. If the thief is trying to steal our identity with lies, but nobody believes the lies, then they can't get anywhere with it and there is no benefit to them. Therefore, the identity is still intact. Satan is very convincing. (laughs) And here's the thing, he doesn't come to us and say, listen, what I'm, about, what I'm about to tempt you to do is a total lie, and it's gonna lead you down a path of destruction. If we could see where he was leading us, we'd never follow him. The power of Satan is in the lie. Remove the lie, and you remove the power. He can't steal who we are with his lies without believing it. Our belief equals our faith. And nothing is more powerful than a faith-filled believer, redeemed, forgiven, chosen, and sanctified and saved by Jesus Christ. And we wonder why he's trying to take us out? 
There's nothing more powerful that will destroy his plan than somebody who is on fire for God. What we believe makes all the difference. So who are you? What do you believe? I'm Sonia Bruner. There's a lot of information on my website. Go to soniabruner.com. Check that out. Share this podcast. Oh, God's doing some cool things, y'all. Thanks for your support and your prayers. I'm Sonia Bruner. This is Crud Talk. See you next time.